Hello. <laughs> it is really lovely to see you all and I hope that when I say hello next, you'll all say something back to me. Okay, so hello. Hello, hello Yama. Oh God, interactive sessions. Honestly, some people just get the juice off that. The first thing that we must do on this beautiful land of the Gadigal is to invite a wonderful, wonderful elder, Uncle Chika, to come up and welcome us to his land. So, Uncle? My name is uh, Charles Madden, but known around the inner city of Sydney as Chika. Now, that's a nickname that I got many, many years ago going to Redburn Public School, which is now NCIE, the National Centre of Indigenous Excellence. Folks, I'm from Gadigal land, Aboriginal land. That's the land we're on at the moment. For many, many years, I've lived and worked around the city of Sydney. I've been involved with many different Aboriginal organisations over the years. I've been a director with the Aboriginal Medical Service at Redfern for over 40 years. Also a director with the Redfern Aboriginal Housing Company, Aboriginal Hostels Australia and the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council. I've got to mention that folks. Also a life member of the Redfern All Blacks Rugby League Football Club. Folks, for many, many years I've lived and worked around the city of Sydney. I'd like to take this opportunity this morning to extend a warm and sincere welcome to all of my Aboriginal brothers and sisters, non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters. If we have any brothers and sisters here from the Torres Strait or further afar across the seas, welcome. Welcome to Gadigal land. The Gadigal clan is one of 29 that makes up the Eora Nation. The Eora Nation is bordered by three distinctive landmarks. We have the Hawkesbury River to the north, and the Peen to the west, and the Georges River to the south. Those three rivers form the boundaries of the Eora Nation. Folks, if you've travelled across this great city of ours today, the state all from afar, welcome. Welcome to Gadigal land. Enjoy your stay. Have a safe and trouble-free trip home. Once again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Enjoy the day, folks. Thank you. Oh, it's lovely. Absolutely fantastic to have you here, Uncle Chika. And I'd like to add my voice also in acknowledging this beautiful, amazing country and to recognise that there's no part of Australia that hasn't been known, loved and nurtured since time began. My name's Lisa. I'm a Koori woman. My mob come from Wagga Wagga. Uh, and I know, I know, people probably heard me say this before. It's God's own land. It's the most beautiful land on earth, um, as are all your lands, no matter where you're from. So I recognise um, that we are indeed blessed to be here in Australia, uh, that we're on a country that is a nation that has hosted the oldest continuous culture in the whole wide world. What a privilege to be here. So thank you so much, Uncle. Um, so this morning, um, first thing I must say is that our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Mark Scott, is unable to attend. Um, he has become very unwell um, and is still suffering the consequences of COVID. So the public health message is get vaccinated, get often and be well. Um, so today is part of our Reconciliation Week and um, Professor Scott was going to mention a few things uh, about this place. Uh, we all know that this is Australia's first university, but I'll now take some liberties and basically say that this university was founded on a lands that recognised how important it is to honour place. And why I say that is because when the university, the dream, uh, came up in people's minds, they wanted to have a university, they wanted to stop sending their young men in those days overseas on a long and perilous journey, overseas to have an education 
in a place that wasn't here with the hope that they would return, often with a family in tow, to ply their new crafts and trades in this land. And so the university, uh, way back in 1850s, decided, no, 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 the people of the colony, no, 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 we didn't want to keep sending people away. We are now mature, mature enough uh, to be able to have our own place of higher education, our own place of learning. And of course, um, as was the way in the days, I imagine, this is my fantasy speaking now, I imagined that people put a bunch of little white pickets around and said, here will be the first university in Australia, right? And so it began. But what they had to do is that they had to have a visual representation of the university. Am I moving about too much for you? Sorry, I'll try and stay still. Um, a visual representation of the university. So they threw open, as a good democracy could, and they threw open the opportunity of an art competition, right? And so they ran an art competition here, and all of these people um, put in their submissions for this competition. And a bloke called Marshall Claxton, who was a colonial artist of the earliest of days, who has got artwork hanging in the art gallery of New South Wales from the earliest times of this land in the Western view, um, created a story, a beautiful drawing of what he saw as worthy of the first seal of the University of Sydney, the first seal that would bring this place into being. And I imagine that he sat down with his artist tools on a chair and he, he looked around and he talked to some of the local people, some of the Gadigal people, and he learned about the kangaroo uh, grounds, he learned about the various sit-down lands, and he also learned about the importance of the grass tree, the spear tree. And you've probably seen thousands of them around the university. They're called gaddy. And it's from this tree that the local people are named, the gaddy gal, the gaddy gal tree. So we are on the Gadigal campus. Camperdown, Darlington is Gadigal land. This university recognises that and has done so since before it even came to be. If you were to look at the seal today, you would see a picture of Lady Learning sitting upon a plinth putting a laurel wreath upon the head of the kneeling scholar. It's all part of the academic endeavour, right? But behind Lady Learning in the sky is none other than our own Southern Cross. And behind La Lady Learning on the land is none other than the Gaddy tree the tree of the people, the Gadigal people of this land. And I suspect that's what the Vice-Chancellor wants to tell you, is that we're still working through how it is we recognise that we are a university on a land that's always been a place of knowledge, of learning, and an exchange of knowledge, of life transitions, and recognising how that is. So thank you very much for indulging me in this. Thank you very much for coming today. Today we're going to be showing you a couple of interesting videos. The first video uh, is a short um, that will explain a little bit about the video that will come. Um, what we'll do is we'll watch that short now and then when that's finished I'll explain a little bit more about how Around the Kitchen Table came into being. So if we're ready please, can we roll the film? Australia has never had the conversations that it needs to have at every level of society to be able to complete the unfinished business of this land. So in the day, the time was right because Australians were really saying, who are we as a nation? You know, we're coming up to the year 2000, that's not far away. How can we get the role of racism out of our lives and the role of deficit understanding out of our lives so we can truly see how magnificent this place is and how magnificent her peoples are, all of us. That's what I felt uh, at the time and I still feel that passionately now. In um, the 90s, the reconciliation movement came out of these recommendations about the endemic racism in Australian society. It reasserted that racism is a real problem in Australia and that self-determination is essential in Australia. We had a real sense that if anything's going to change, it's going to take women uh, to empower each other, to have those difficult conversations at different kitchen tables. 
away it went. And Lisa was the first one who said, well, we'll meet together and we'll get some ideas and so on and so forth. And the material from this brainstorm that we had, where Lisa also um, shared her um, insight into the name of the video, she said, it's going to be called Around the Kitchen Table because that's where all important decisions are ever made. The formality of setting a table and the process of preparing food for others that they would then consume, like many things, it is an act of service, it's an act of love and it's an invitation to have a conversation in a way that you wouldn't ordinarily have. That's where Aboriginal people love to be too, you know, around the kitchen table where they just eat, you know, the tuckers there on the, all on the table there and everybody's laughing and joking and, and a real happy moments around the table when the, the food's on the table. So, you know, that's our, that's our ways. I think there'd been a long tradition of community activism boiled up from kitchen table conversations, right back to the 1967 referendum when people were working across all the whole of Australia having these yarns about how we needed to um, change the constitution at the time. Because of racism, there was a lack of trust and reconciliation, as Aunty Rasmi says in the video, gave Aboriginal people a platform to be heard because so often their voices had been absent from conversations and so often the huge amount of knowledge that they had to contribute was, was overlooked. The story that we started with is that reconciliation is a journey for us all. It's not to be left up to Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people. It's to the responsibility of all of us. It's about listening carefully to the wisdom of others. It's about listening and sharing and engaging with ideas. The conversation about reconciliation was happening within communities. And so to reflect that and to respect that, Elaine and Lisa were very clear that the, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women would be filmed in their homes. The women of leadership would gather in one group, new Australians in another group. And it's good listening to each group what we'd done back there, it was beginning to come really good and all of a sudden, bang, it run into a brick wall. And I think it's gonna take a long time for that closing the gap. begin and a lot of people ask that how on earth this is 24 years old and when we did this video we were thinking at the time this could have been done 20 years prior and would the message have changed and if we'd done it 20 years before then would it have been much different well the clothes might be a bit different and the technology would have been a bit different but still we have a lot of unfinished business of this land and we're going to show you the video in a moment just imagine uh, that you were there 24 years ago. Just imagine you're a participant at that table. Just imagine what it would be like uh, to have uh, that kind of aspiration that in a decade or two decades, Australia would have a treaty. We would have closed the gap. Aboriginal children wouldn't be residing in out of home care to the rates uh, that some would imagine uh, they could be. Uh, and that all Australians knew something of language, of how it is to belong. These are really vital conversations now as they were then. But how this started um, was, um, of course, at the State Library of New South Wales in the early 90s. And then in around about 1995, the University of Sydney hosted a number of key conversations with many of the elders, including Arnie Alley and her beloved uh, sister, Arnie Ann, uh, at the old Koori Centre, which is not far from here. It's at the old Teachers College. And we had a number of meetings there with other community members as well. And that was when the International House, part of this university, hosted our inaugural spirit event. 
And it was from that spirit event that a lot of the artwork that you see in the movie uh, in a moment or in the, in the program, the one hour video that you're about to witness, or the 34 minute video that you're about to witness uh, came from. So without further ado, let's go to the video. Thank you. The laws were made by the Dreamtime spirits. For Aboriginal people, they aren't changed. White laws can be changed so many times, mm -hmm. but with our culture, it never changes. And both men and women are custodians of this country of the dreaming. Mm -hmm. And so wherever we go, wherever we are, there are sites there, very significant places mm -hmm. all over this country because we are part of this earth and we are this country. Reconciliation is a big word. Maybe it's not very clear to people. When you say that it's all about truth, and that means knowing the truth, knowing the history, learning the culture, and being decent. And I think that's fairly irresistible to most people. It's acceptance, and it's accepting one another. I prefer to think of reconciliation as a bridge building time. Mm. Um, because a lot of our people are not happy with the word reconciliation, mm -hmm. but they do accept the word build bridge, building bridges. And he said, you know, what a shame. White fellas have never given black fellas the chance to welcome them to, into their country. <laughs> might like to talk to me about seeing I'm a young fella, young one. Yeah. Tell me about some of the protocols and things that we should be thinking mm. about in this reconciliation. One protocol I think we should all remember. Um, there's other protocols when coming into country. Um, being welcomed in and um, I found that coming here um, into this new part of the country. I've never been here before, so I don't know much history of the, the uh, traditional owners that were here. This is a yeah. Tharawal. This is Tharawal land. Is it? Tharawal. Yeah, this, oh, this, right. and down there, there are over 300 sites that this oh. house looks down on, on oh. Holsworthy. Oh. So, Great. yeah, this is Tharawal land. We, find out, we found out before when we bought this land, whose land it was on, so... Mm. So, in a way, you've welcomed us. Mm. Yes. Um. We welcome you <laughs> onto Thorough land. Thorough. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. We were sitting around a campfire and um, Muljali, I can say his name because that isn't his, um, that, that, that isn't his skin name. A long time ago, he said, when strangers came into our country, we would go out to welcome them. And he said we'd do the jumbas. That's what they call corroborees in, in um, Nyaranyan country. And he said, and, and we would tell the stories of our countries and the stranger Aborigines would tell the stories of their countries through their jumbas. And he said sometimes these jumbas would go on maybe for one day, maybe two days, maybe even longer. And then at the end of it all, he said, we didn't think of them as strangers. We thought of them as friends because we knew they had the one good, the spirit of the country in their hearts and therefore they would never damage the land either. 
and he said, you know, what a shame. White fellas have never given black fellas the chance to welcome them to, into their country. And this is so sad. He said, not only for white fellas, but black fellas too. Because if white fellas understood and had the one good in their hearts like we do, then they would have the same belonging to country that we have. That was when I started to think, well, what can I do to try and help reconciliation process. If only we had heard these stories, then we would have a much stronger sense of belonging. When I did have an opportunity to go into Aboriginal Australia in urban and tribal areas, I found that there were things I could immediately connect with, and there was a connection of the heart as well, and a feeling of finding there the deep roots of the country, which I had not been able to find up to that point. And it's beautiful how the culture has evolved this way of belonging to land, uh, which ownership and possession doesn't take into account the thousands of years which enable um, Aboriginal people to feel that belonging. We came to Australia in order to escape uh, Hitler's uh, policy of genocide against the Druids. And so I understand uh, the feelings of, of being uprooted, of being a child removed from family, friends, school, put into a very strange environment. We arrived in Australia into a policy of assimilation. Yes. And therefore, we dropped, we dropped our cultural bundles and we dropped our ethnic languages. And, um, and this is the pity of it. Because you can never forget your roots. You can, I could never forget my little village. I could never forget my Greek. I could never forget my Greek religion. I have an 11-year-old son. I took him to Greece three times because I want him to know where he has come from, where his parents and grandparents and other parents, and where he belongs. I was uh, a stolen, part of the, uh, one of the stolen generation, so it was really important for me to know where I belonged. When I went to a sacred site, it was a, a birthing place, and I'd always mm -hmm. had this um, longing in me to say, well, I never really said goodbye to Mum, and I actually, went to an, a birthing place, I was taken there, permission to go in, everything was done right. And I actually, at that birthing place, in spirit, I went right back into my mother's womb. Mm, and it was amazing. amazing. And, and, you know, that didn't come from um, um, any religious belief. No, mm, That's what like that. sacred sites, when Aboriginal people talk about sacred sites, mm. This is what it's really all about, where the, the spirit is there, you know. That took away that real deep longing. That sort of healing is what's got to happen to anybody that's been hurt, um, whether they've been forcibly removed, whether they've been taken from their land, whatever way it's been. <laughs> Owners of this country, we've never relinquished it, mm. we've never signed a treaty, mm. and we, we've got to keep enforcing that into our children because we're really, we're not dispossessed people. We still walk this land. We still are the owners of this land. We belong to the land. If we lose our native title, I feel there won't be any reconciliation. Mm. But if we still have our native title and there's still no apologies from the Prime Minister and mm. whoever, I do think there'll be reconciliation mm. because I think we'll all work at that still. What is in question, certainly with the native title and with the WIC, is, is having the opportunity to go on the land, not to take over it. One of the other things I've learned from Aborigines is that their sense of, they, of the word ownership is inclusive. It includes everybody. And that's what makes me sad to think, that the majority of pastoralists are actually poorer people for not having sat down and listened. I had the opportunity to meet a woman who started off as a, a, a TAFE student, and she always talked about her people and herself as a Koori. This helped me to understand that it wasn't what, how dark her skin was, it was her concept of herself that really mattered. When I'm 
in the South, people say I'm Torres Strait. And when I'm with some Torres Strait people, you say, I've been with the Aboriginal people too long, so I'm more <laughs> Aboriginal there. Yeah, when I'm with white the people, <laughs> they say, you're black. And when you're with black people, you say, you're, you're white. white. So <laughs> I say to everybody, I'm me. I heard the elders saying then to the people, like, you know, you're either Aboriginal or you're not yeah. now. None yeah. of this yeah. business. Yeah. So when anyone says to me, you, you've got a bit Aboriginal in you, you know, and so, well, look, I'm all Aboriginal. The ministers, you know, the yeah. Aboriginal affairs ministers and... Saying, oh, the real Aborigines are the, mm. the real ones. They're in the, the territory. Yeah, the real yeah. Aborigines, yeah. you know. The real ones. And, um, you know, you, you, you come up against that all the time yes. when you. And sometimes, you, you know, you have to really address these things straight away. Yes. They seriously don't understand mm. that those people can be Aborigine because they immediately think of traditional Aboriginal people. They immediately think of skin colour. Yeah, yes, as yes, defining yes. them yeah, being Aboriginal, yeah. but it doesn't. I mean, what defines me being Irish? Accent. Pretty easy. As against the skin colour. The skin colour. No, no, but you see, exactly the same thing happens, and I've had it said to me here, ah, you're not really Irish because you come from the city and you don't come from the West. Yeah. That's exactly the same thing. That makes me an urban Irish as against a tribal Irish. Well, I was born in central New South Wales, central western New South Wales, and I went to a one-teacher school, and there are black children there, and it wasn't until I read Sally Morgan's book that I realised that they were Aboriginal, because I th we were always told they are Indian. Oh. And when she talks about being Indian in the book, I suddenly go, click. And I said, well, why do we call them Indian? And they said, well, it was better than being Aboriginal. Yes. And my father always said, Keep yourself nice and tidy if you're going to be in the uh, white society. Which one? They're going to look at you. <laughs> Keep yourself <laughs> nice and tidy. Gossamer hairspray when it first came out. <laughs> <laughs> no heaviest hail or wind had ever moved my hair. Oh, gossamer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 My husband was a white man. Ah, oh, well, that's, you know, that's the, why. the face that expressions, the it. body language would yeah. stick out a mile. That that's it. why she's got her hair into place. That's why oh. she's dressed, a, uh, you know, with this magic white touch. Yeah, you know? I get that. Mm -hmm. I looked at the old matron's uh, reports, and over the years, you know, she has to write this monthly report. And when I was, uh, when I was, it must have been really good, or when I was bad, when she described my complexion, I was sometimes I was almost white, mm. and when I must have been playing up at the time, <laughs> I, she described my complexion as very dark, yeah, mm. yes. and you know, and it really hit me yeah. that that's how they mm. see you, that's you know, right. and and a lot of non-Aboriginal people out there judge us by the colour of our skin. Yes. Mm. What we must do is not make fe people feel, because they didn't know the Aboriginal culture, they are out, because they feel that they, they feel that they are not good enough to be in this movement, because we recognise that the reconciliation process now has become the people's movement. Can I tell you something? In order to change situations in a society, you have to educate and legislate, right? So we need leadership. And unless there is leadership from the Prime Minister, the people out there, they're scared. Some of them are scared. The other ones, like us, we know the issues, we've been through them, and we are doing something about it. We raise children, we teach them to apologise, and we say, you must say sorry in order to make progress and move on to the next area. He's a man who says he's a family man, yeah. and he can't do the fundamental things that you do in families, which is, deal with the past in order to pro make progress in the future. There are apologies happening everywhere. The churches are apologising. Sorry, sorry. Different people, the sorry yeah. books around. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of the Aboriginal people know that this isn't just for stolen babies, but this is sorry for what we've done to you. Yeah. you, you I mean, if somebody says sorry to you, you feel like forgiving them, yeah. especially if they mean it.
reconciliation process has really given a platform for people in a non-threatening way to come together because before people felt uncomfortable on both sides and I think this has been the only thing in this country that's given everybody this chance to yeah. become yeah. united. Yeah. Yes. What reconciliation has done, mm. the process anyway, has allowed us to have a say mm. yes. and, and people can't hear us enough. We have to be practical and to do some practical things to demonstrate, you know, that we really are care for each other and also that we are all the people of Australia. We took um, a youth children to the Aboriginal land and then we show them the, the kind of culture, the kind of uh, uh, way of life they were living. And for them, it was an excellent uh, experience, which has encouraged others, like the girls, they, they were wearing a special T-shirt, which they bought from there. And they were really proud for people to ask them, where did you get this T-shirt from? So each one of us does one thing. But I, I think that we have to encourage people to be part of a movement. One person speaking alone is not going to be enough. I know I want change. And I have to change too, I know that. So we started this group called uh, Wicked and we decided that we would run old-fashioned political meetings which would be empowering. And the contract was we did the organisation, we asked the speakers, we made it possible for the Aboriginal people's voices to be heard and we took the background position. If someone else comes along and says, I'll run a meeting in my area and suddenly we've got ten meetings going. I include Aboriginal in nearly every single thing of my work that I do. Mm. Uh, it just comes in even if people think it's a pain, which yes. some of them do. I mean, I know people who think, I wish she'd shot up. Mm -hmm. Last year at my graduation mm -hmm. ceremonies, what I did when I got up was welcome people to Ngunnawal country. Well, nobody's ever done this at a university before, and I could see some of the people sitting on the stage nearly going off their faces. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, it's too bad, but by the end of nine graduation ceremonies, it has had the most enormous effect. Just somebody in, in school who's got a kid at school can say to the principal of the school, look, could you make sure every day at assembly that we just acknowledge country? You don't have to be the chancellor of a university. Mm, right. I've just moved and I'm in Camaragal country and uh, find it out and, and say it like a grace. It's yes, great. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. People can volunteer their services to participate not in functions that they create, but in other people's functions. Attend that school fate and do something there to focus people's attention. It could be a small exhibition of, of, of uh, uh, Aboriginal art. It could be some storytelling. Because there is nothing as powerful as giving people a small task which they can do. It's a passion for the possible. I wear Aboriginal colours around the place. And I have decided quite carefully that when people say, what's that in aid of? Uh, I say, well, it's to remind us that we're in a process of reconciliation with Aboriginal people. The Greek <laughs> festival, they got together and they said, look, we want the Aboriginal people to come closer to us and to sit and talk so we can listen. So I thought, gee, that was a great idea. So we did. One man got up, he was that angry, it's a shame on me, mm. being a resident in this country. He said, I want to sign that book, yeah. because I am sorry too. Afterwards, when we finished talking, they come down and they just held us. Mm. Mm. Just for one second, never spoke, but mm. just held us. And that's the kind of response. It's going to put that black hand and that white hand together and walk. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
Saying sorry, that's not enough. We've got to do something. Reconciliation actually comes from the word concilium, which is convoking, talking together. It's just as simple as that. And we don't talk together. We won't know each other. This is a perfect opportunity for us as a complete society to, uh, to dig within ourselves and go out and, and uh, acquire some better conflict resolution techniques. Yes. We can be political and not be confrontational. Absolutely. We can be uh, 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 forthright and still be reconciling in all of this. And we will serve uh, at the cause of reconciliation much better if we do this in a way which is inclusive just as the, uh, 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 the Aboriginal concept of land is inclusive. I think it's very important for people, whoever they are, to maintain their culture, their language, their religion, and everything that is important to them, you know, within the setting that we are. And together, you know, uh, we have unity in diversity. And I believe that without addressing the Indigenous issue, there is not going to be any peace in this land. So we are all tied up with the land, this is now our home, and there should be uh, a continuation of the talk and the conversation and the search for peace. I was at a reconciliation um, meeting last week at Manly, and um, part of me wanted to cry. Part of me was sad, and I wanted to cry because I, I just feel sad about the political situation that's in the country at the moment. Mm. But the other part of me wanted to cry because I was so happy to see mm. so many people, like there were 500 people there, mm. and, uh, and, and walk away with a bit more knowledge, a bit more bridge yeah. building take mm. place mm. Uh, to help with this healing. So I, I'm feeling a little bit, bit happier about the healing that's taking place. Mm. And I don't think it'll finish by year 2001. Mm. I mm. think that we will just continue on to whatever that we have energy. Yeah. And, yeah. and as far as healing the nation is concerned, we as Aboriginal individuals and women, we need to heal ourselves first. Mm. We have to have a lot of healing in ourselves. Mm. And then we can heal our families and help heal our communities and then it just spreads out. So true. Mm. And I think that one, once that starts to happen, um, and as we unite more with our non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters, mm. I think that, the, you know, I can't see how it can go wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
so much passion, love. We had a shoestring budget. The Department of Women in the Day in New South Wales gave us this itty bitty little bit of money and we were able to impress upon so many um, to be able to participate in this. And that credits, I, you know, I, I do expect everyone to have a good look at those credits. And I saw a few people go, oh, wow, I see some names I know. Um, so it's absolutely fantastic. So it was done with a lot of love. The other thing that um, it was done with um, is that it was done with a lot of babies that were being cooked. And uh, we have a number of children who are reconciliation babies, and one of them's sitting in this room right now, and I'm so terribly proud of my niece. Um, and we've also got another one around about now that's about to come into the world uh, who's a member of our team. So there's another reconciliation baby for you. So we'll claim credit for every baby born in between, okay? So I'm delighted to be able to say that um, we've got two absolutely amazing women sitting here with me. Auntie Ali Golding is a Birupai woman who grew up on uh, Mishit Purfley outside of Taree, lived on the block for a long, long time. Mm, 27 years. Was known years. as the Rose of Redfern at one point oh. and is actually the famous Gossamer Girl that you saw in the movie. <laughs> um, she has been an extraordinary advocate, um, she's always been there for Aboriginal um, kids on the block. She's always supported this work as hard as it has been sometimes and as much uh, effort as it has taken. Mm -hmm. uh, Aunty Ali has always been there with us and, um, you know, there's a lot of people that were in the film who are no longer with us, who are hoping to see a different story by this time um, and in their lifetimes, but nonetheless, we have got a sacred journey to continue that important um, work. Yes. And we have had an apology from mm, the government today. the day. And, you know, WIC did come through. Um, and Native Title is journeying. And there are discussions of treaty. And there are discussions about a voice. But when you think about all that needs to happen, um, you know, we have a long way to go. With me also is Rosie Ogilvy, uh, one of my um, peers and colleagues, a Vice Principal of Advancement. She leads the team responsible for delivering major gifts to the university and uh, was very much a part of the Successful Inspired campaign where she basically asked people to envision what a future for this university could look like and invited them to contribute. Uh, and they did so willingly and in volume. And so a lot of the work that we do now in this portfolio um, is, is in part because of the work of Rosie and her team and of others like her in the world of philanthropy. So it's absolutely wonderful um, to have you both here. So we'll have a few questions of our panellists, then hopefully we'll have a couple of minutes to ask for some reflections from the audience. Um, and then following, we will show you another short video about the voice from the heart, which we're very excited about. And then you're all invited to morning tea upstairs. So we've got a nice fancy morning tea for you, so don't run away. So I might start with a statement. Be brave, make change is the theme for this year's National Reconciliation Week. Now, Aunty Ali, what does that mean to you to be brave and make change this Reconciliation Week? What's the first one, make? Uh, be brave. Be brave. And make change. And make change. When I did look at the, that film, I thought to myself, where did it all go? Where did it all go, that activity, the busy part of, of reconciliation back then with all the seed hands being placed around, all different nationalities of people with children, all gathering together with the seed hands all that happenings of that activities back there and then, where have that gone? It reminds me of a, um, that song, Where Have All the Flowers, the flowers Gone? gone. Mm. When I was looking at that, that film. And, um, you know, NADOC Week we know has been closed through this COVID-19, has stopped and blocked of a lot of things for, for our energy to move on and to think what we're going to do now, you know? Where, how are we going to be go from here now and walk onwards now after we've been 
standing still and coming up against this brick wall of the nine, um, COVID-19. So, um, repeat that word to me again. Uh, be brave. Be brave. Make change. And make change. That braveness, we did lose it along the way. I believe that. It went all quite. Long before the COVID-19 came, that brave, braveness sort of vanished a little bit, which is to me, it was really sad. You know, there's, there's been a jump from the 60s. There was the, our people out on the streets protesting for what we need, what our people need in this country. And then that was all alive and a lot of activities, a lot of things was going on then. You know, people were waking up and saying, hey, these Aboriginal people, they're, they're, they're um, you know, taking these flags out on the streets, taking the mics in the park there. And here they are, you know, loud and we're hearing them. Their voices came. But to me, uh, as an elder now, thinking back at that time, from the 60s, where the noise was, where the voice was, it, it faded. Yeah. That faded yeah. until NAIDOC week started established with, you know, with the um, NAIDOC week every year. Yeah. That started coming back again. It sort of started to lift again. The voices started of being heard again. And I'm thinking, you know, oh, hello. The voice is getting a bit loud, but not as loud as the 60s. We need to get louder. Yeah. And somewhere along the line, with NAIDOC weeks, it wasn't, it wasn't good enough as the sea of hands, what I see. And that activity took place outside because I think NAIDOC week has been getting closed up and have an all entertainment in buildings in the opera house, all indoors and not outdoors so much as when the sea of hands, all the beaches, all the parks was filled, people taking their own hands, colourful hands and placing it and coming together like that, committing one another in that way. But now I feel that boldness has faded and we need that to come back now. We need to get bold again. Mm. We need to put more power in our voices to be heard again. Because I think people went a little bit deaf. Yeah. They went a little bit deaf of our voices. So it's time I believe now that our voices should come out louder now and we should get bolder and we still should step forward and look at our children and see how important our children are today. We have to step out. We have to be bold. We have to voice, uh, have our voice heard and be loud mm. for them, for them to live on and carry their vo their voices on to their voices on to the next generation. So yeah. let's try doing that in being noisy again and voice ourselves and be bold this time. All right, sounds like sounds like a call to action. You know, we um, you're right. You know, things things have gone a little bit quieter, and the opportunity for us to be brave and make change is is upon yeah. us. And um, you know, I suppose also right now we're also concerned about so much. We've pushed so much on the future generations. You know, mm. we haven't, we had many opportunities, as you've said, over such a long time yeah. to deal with the unfinished business of this land yeah. for Australia's first peoples. Yes. We're still discussing it. There's action happening, but gee whiz, it seems like a long time, doesn't it, Aunt? Yes. You know, and yes. we've got a whole swag of other things that we're dealing with at the moment, including, you know, catastrophic climate change, including things like pandemics. I mean, there's there's some massive shifts, so now's the time. Yes. Rosie, how about you? Be brave. Um, 
So as a non-Aboriginal woman, when I was thinking about this week's Re Re Reconciliation Week's theme, for me, um, the thing that first came to mind was brave, brave enough to keep learning and brave enough to say that I don't know and I need to ask the question. And I, need, I was just thinking the other day, I'm, I'm heading to Melbourne in a few weeks' time, and I thought, I left Melbourne in 2004, and um, at that time I, I had never seen acknowledgement of country or a welcome to country. It was not part of oh. everything about life in Melbourne at that time. And so I actually didn't even know the Aboriginal name for where Melbourne was. And um, so I thought, well, that's not good enough. I need to find out. So I've done a lot of research online um, and tried to sort of just acknowledge the fact that there is no end to the learning that you can do. And, and it kind of, I think, supports reconciliation and that it helps encourage a sense of impatience that there's not enough done yet. And... Um, we're on a journey that doesn't have an end date yet um, and we really have to kind of keep pushing. Um, and the more I learn, the more I think that that is true. Yeah, I suppose the thing with change and the thing with journey is that there isn't an end point, is there? But what we do know is what we have now uh, is not satisfactory, it's mm. not respectful. Mm -hmm. You've described philanthropy as an act of reconciliation. I'd really love you to unpack that a little bit mm -hmm. for us. Well, um, thinking about... Uh, particularly thinking about our donors who, who give to Aboriginal purposes, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander purposes at the university. Um, just reflecting on my conversations with them and, and when they've described what motivates them to make a gift. There are a couple of things that, that really, I think, resonate in the context of Reconciliation Week. Um, the first is that, that they, to a T, all have a strong sense of social justice and that things need to... There is, a, there is currently an injustice um, in the world in, as regards all sorts of issues related to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. And um, they're not happy about them. It's not good enough. They also have a strong sense that, um, that words are not enough. Action is, ac action is what's required. And for them, their philanthropy is a way of taking action um, and um, actually empowering others, particularly empowering Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders coming to the university, being on the lands here. Um, and then I think there's a sense of hope and faith that things can get better and um, that, that part of what they're doing by giving a gift um, uh, to the university is expressing that hope and faith that things will, will improve and that they want to be part of that journey. And so for me, those three points are um, not necessarily everything about what reconciliation is about, but I think those, they overlap heavily with a lot of themes that come through um, through reconciliation discussions and, and the week that we're having. Mm, thank you so much. Yeah, that's a really important point and it sort of goes back to the heart of really what we're talking about, which is about trust and about love and about yeah, mutual trust respect. Trust especially. Yeah. Because, you know, I'm, I, I look around at empty seats here and so long I've been, you know, with this reconciliation group and I think now and again there was always a one or two Aboriginal person in this, the, uh, the reconciliation group I've been, been in for years that they'd come and they go. I was always been there. And in, uh, I, I felt really alone as an Aboriginal person in this group of non-Aboriginal people who were thinking about supporting and fighting for the rights of Aboriginal people in this country. And I was just the Aboriginal person that was in this group all the time. And I'm looking around here even tonight, you know, when, uh, this afternoon, why that it would have been really good seeing Aboriginal people sitting all there, coming together, so we can all think together, wish together, hope together, you know, and work together and voice ourselves together. But it's not happening among our black people. Where are they? So I think all these black organisations that's in every state in Australia, 
even in New South Wales, even in Sydney here, would come together and, and really, really support what the reconciliation groups are doing in, in, in Sydney especially. And if we can widen and show that goodness of black and white coming together for, the, for that greatest and hope and reasons for Aboriginal people of our great needs in this country, it must be much better. So I, I think it was uh, Sister Betty Little mm. that mentioned it. She said, it's not only white people that could be aggressive and being stubborn towards hearing the voice of Aboriginal people. They're our own, our own Aboriginal people are like this too. Oh, who do those white fellows think they are? Going out there talking about us and all this and that. Not thinking right in their minds that, hey, listen to them. They are valuable people, these white people, when they get up there and be bold and want to do something and support Aboriginal people where this black person should be going and saying, thank you, I value this, what you're doing, what, where your heart is, you know, you're in the genuine, a lot of genuine people. I value a lot of white, genuine friends of mine of what they're doing, but there's a lot more Aboriginal people. Our organisations should be supporting us, not turning away and saying, who do these white people think they are, what they're doing? They should come together. Mm. Some of them could be really stubborn in their own ways. And then that's my greatest hope as an Aboriginal elder. I want to see my people have that light light up in their, in their minds, in their brains, and in their hearts, in their spirits. Well, if these people are going to use their energy and want to help us, why not? And I think this is the only way where we're going to see that healing take place in this country as our Aboriginal people doing that thinking from the heart of our, the, the, the needs of our, what we need in this country. Make that, because of the change in the government now with the voting and everything now, and who's there in there at Parliament House, give it a try now. There might be a little possibility of hope that we can walk together, come together, walk together with that greatest hope of healing together. Thanks, Aunt. Mm -hmm. The profound words and, you know, when you talk about... Um, be brave and make change. Well, we've got a beautiful example of yes. that here with our darling Aunt Ali. Uh, so it is up to the 97% to assist Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people get cracking and get things moving. And the most amazing thing is that there are many on the journey. Um, and that journey is different, but I, I think you're right. We do absolutely need to get out there and get productive. Now, we have time for only one question, and I can see um, uh, Burning Illusions waving her hand madly. <laughs> Uh, to say a word, Burning Illusion. So this is Sally Fitzpatrick, who was the producer of the Around the Kitchen Table. So I, I too would love to um, acknowledge that we're on Gadigal land gathered here today um, safely in a brave space. And um, we had a change of government just the other day and hopefully this has opened up an, a brave political space for us to all organise in and come together around a meaningful change in the country. But also, Ani Ali, I hear you when you say people don't attend to these events, like Aboriginal groups perhaps and might be a little bit frustrated by the reconciliation process yes. or they think they've already given this a shot and look what happened, look what John Howard did. He wrecked it for us and, and, and many white people feel that way too. Mm. Um, but we still haven't learned to listen as well um, properly. I really think as much as there is a need for a voice, there is a really important need to listen. And whitefellas haven't really learned to attend with open hearts and listen properly. Like we saw the other day on Channel 7 when they put that ridiculous documentary about that policeman oh, for my family on the very same day when we're celebrating from the new government and that, and that stupid television station put a documentary 
about that policeman who murdered our countrymen on the television that same day and created so much misery in the middle of the centre of the heart of this country. And all for what? You know, all for what? Yeah. And those mistakes keep getting made and people need to wake up mm. and think before they do things. Absolutely. Think Absolutely. before they act. It's all we, we all need to do stuff. Like that's what consciousness raising is about. We need to act. We can't just sit around and feel good. We can't just watch that dance and go, oh, isn't that lovely? Yeah. Yeah. We have to work. We, we have, have to, to work change. Together. We have to act. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we need to be mindful how we do things. Mm -hmm. Think about whose feelings are involved. Think about whose place we're in. Whose job are we taking? Whose roles, whose children are we raising? And it's really hard because there's those pains come every day. I watch my Aboriginal sisters and brothers get hurt every day because of people not thinking and being careless. And not being human in how they think. Like the, you know, Auntie Chelsea says, where's the humanity? Right. We've got to think really carefully why we're doing stuff, yeah. when we're being brave. Thank you. Thanks, Sally. It's a really good point. And we'll be able to continue this conversation upstairs, so please be assured uh, that there is more that can be said. I am mindful that we are coming to the end of our time right now. Um, but we can continue the conversation upstairs if that's okay with people. I hate closing down conversations like this because they're really powerful and you've come to listen, haven't you? You've come to learn, uh, as we all have, so thank you so much. Um, I'd like to say thank you to our deadly panellists, Rosie Ogilvie and, of course, Arnie Ali golding They'll be joining us for morning tea upstairs. We have another little video for you. Today is the day of videos, um, and this is a video about a little bit of action that you might be interested in taking. So we'll get you to play that. Thanks, Cornell. For a long time, for 200 and something years, it's been Europeans or white settlers making decisions for and about Aboriginal people. Um, and I think if we're ever gonna, you know, make steps in self-determination, Aboriginal people know Aboriginal people best. Um, so I think it's really important that we're the ones making decisions that directly affect us. 2022, we still don't have a framework where Indigenous people are represented into our legal, legislative and constitutional processes. I don't think our histories are told and owned by the nation. First Nations have never ceded sovereignty to their lands and their waters. It is our responsibility now to redefine our nation. And it is our responsibility now in 2022 to walk together towards a referendum, to enshrine a First Nations voice in our constitution. So when we look at the voice from the heart and when we look at this statement, how can we not be moved to recognise its importance as we move into the next phase of our history and our maturity. Do you want this unfinished business to continue going on for the next generations to deal with? It is time now. 1967, we were counted, and in 2017, we want to be heard, and that really resonates with me. There are two lines in there that really resonate with me. And one is talking about how 60 millennia worth of our histories, how could they be erased in 200 years? The other part that resonates with me is where we're calling for our rightful place in our own country. Well, so the protection of the enshrinement in the parliament is kind of essential because I understand there's been quite a lot of uh, indigenous based policy that's kind of just been left behind, uh, hasn't really been recognized or enforced. And so it's essential that it's provided that protection specifically from the constitution. Having the constitutionally enshrined voice ensures that whichever party's in power, will still have that voice in Parliament. This unfinished business is a matter for all Australians to walk with us together on this journey of reckoning, of reconciliation, and redefining the rightful place of First Nations in our national narrative. Right on.
on that. She's little, spot on that Tila, isn't yes. she? She knows she knows how to yes. get the heart beating. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, there's been a, a lot we can do, a lot we have done, and a lot more to do. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, all of the team that has made this happen. Thank you so much, Rosie. Thank you so much, Aunt. Thank you so much, Uncle, uh, for coming and welcoming us to country. He's gone off to the next thing that he has to do. I'd like to uh, recognise also our deadly Auslan interpreters who are here, and they always get a bit of a surprise because then they have to interpret their own acknowledgement, which is really good. Um, and, yeah, I'd just uh, like to thank you all for coming. Please join us upstairs um, for a nice cup of tea and a bicky, no doubt. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care.